Welcome to today's webinar, Under the Bonnet, from Energy Saving Trust Scottish Transport Team, which will cover electric vehicle battery misconceptions. My name is Gordon McGregor, and I work in the transport team, specifically dealing with business advice, as well as our employee engagement program, Switched On at Work. Both the programs and this webinar is funded by Transport Scotland. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Kalina Stormworth Darlin, who deals with the low carbon transport loan and is doing all the technical stuff today. So if something does go wrong, please blame Kalina. Firstly, uh, before we begin, it's my birthday today. So after three, you can all sing me happy birthday. One, two, three, go. Lovely. Perfect harmony there. Um, that does lead me on to my next point. We can't actually hear you, but you can hear us. That's just the way it is for webinars. Um, some other quick general points about the webinar today. It will last for around 60 minutes with uh, some Q&A involved, but we will go on all night if we have to. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar. Uh, if you do happen to have a question, please type them in the text box in the sidebar of your screen and we'll respond during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Due to the volume of questions we may get, it might not be possible to respond to all of these, so we apologize for this. If you really would like to get a response to your query, our contact details will be at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to get in touch. We'll be running a few polls during the webinar. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to get through today, so we don't want to spend too long on that. Normally, we'd give about a minute response time. We'll probably cut it down to 20, 30 seconds. So please try and answer them as quickly as possible. The way this will work is we'll pose a question to you with multiple choice responses, and then just click whichever one you agree with. Uh, we will be recording the webinar and we hope to be able to make it available online. We'll also circulate the slides afterwards. So I'd now like to introduce our first and only speaker, Dr. Ewan McTurk. He's kindly agreed to join us today. So over to you, Ewan. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and thank you to Energy Saving Trust Scotland for inviting me to do this presentation. So I am Dr Ewan McTurk. I'm a battery electrochemist working for Edinburgh-based firm Ducosi, uh, who have developed a very nifty way of looking after the batteries in electric vehicles and grid storage and so on. Uh, may come as no surprise to you that I'll be telling you a bit more about how we do that later on. So I've been working on batteries for the best part of a decade before joining Ducosi last year. My speciality was inserting uh, various probes into commercial lithium-ion cells uh, to find out more about how they behave because they are black box systems. So when you actually find out what's going on inside them, you can improve their performance whilst increasing their longevity. And prior to that, I specialised in next generation chemistries, trying to develop the next big thing. So I was working on lithium air batteries, which are breathing batteries that kind of have something in common with fuel cells uh, and are quite a radical departure from what's in your phone, your laptop or your electric car today. Again, I'll tell you about them later. Uh, but I've been driving electric vehicles since 2009 and uh, throughout my sort of decade of battery research, I didn't choose the plug life. The plug life chose me when the person who would become my project supervisor at the University of Dundee turned up in a 1999 Peugeot 106 electric. Uh, I ended up doing my project on that and buying it off them when I left. Here it is, comfortably seeing me through the great fuel crisis of 2012. So let's begin with the basics. What exactly is a battery? Well, every electric vehicle has a battery pack, which is made up of a series of modules in which there will be a number of individual cells. Now, it's within the actual cells that the electrochemistry takes place that gives you the power to power the vehicle. There are a number of different types of cell available. You've got cylindrical cells. Uh, those ones up at the top are very similar to what's used in a Tesla Model S. Those are so-called 18650 cells, 18 millimetres wide by 65.0 mil tall. You also get prismatic cells, big, chunky, boxy things, much easier to handle. You need a lot less of them to get the same level of capacity because they're a lot bigger. Those particular ones are the same as what's used in a BMW i3. 
and then you get the pouch cell that's used in most other electric vehicles on the market. Uh, these have very thin walls on them, as you can see, uh, and they're made up usually of a stack of electrodes inside rather than a coil, which is what you would get in a cylindrical cell. So the Nissan Leaf and the Renault Zoe are two examples of many EVs that use pouch cells. So lithium ion, of course, is the golden standard for electric vehicle batteries these days. Uh, how does this work? Well, inside every lithium ion battery, you will have your negative electrode, which is called the anode. This is typically made up of graphite, in other words, layered carbon sheets. And into those, you have lithium atoms that have intercalated into the structure. That means they've pigeonholed themselves in between the sheets rather than actually chemically bonded to them. And then for the positive electrode, you will have a lithium heavy metal oxide. Now that just means there's lithium, there's oxygen, and then there'll be some sort of heavier metal in the middle as well. Uh, I've given an example of cobalt, which is one that's used in smartphones and laptops a lot, but less so in electric vehicles now. Uh, in between those, you'll have a separator, normally some sort of polymer, plasticky looking material, uh, which will be soaked in an electrolyte, which is a conductive uh, fluid of some description, usually a liquid or, or perhaps a gel. Um, that will have some sort of lithium salt there as well that makes it conductive to lithium ions, but not to electrons. Now, because there's only one way for uh, electrons to go, that because of the um, separator being electrically insulating, they have to go through the external circuit. So what happens is that lithium atoms, lithium atoms uh, lose an electron each and then end up migrating across to the cathode and becoming a physical part of that heavy metal oxide, changing the lithium content. Meanwhile, the electrons travel through the external circuit, powering anything that they are uh, attached to, that the external circuit is attached to, for example, your electric car, and then re-bond with the lithium ions at the other end. And the exact opposite happens during charging. But it's not always been lithium ion. So I'll take you through a history of electric vehicle batteries. Now, what do all of these electric vehicles that we have in front of us have in common? There's about 70 years that spans between them. You've got an electric taxi from New York at the end of the Victorian era, which actually had battery swapping a good century before Tesla and Better Place considered it. You've got a world record land speed holder, the Jamais Content, uh, which held a, a staggering 60 mile an hour speed record for some time. Uh, and then you're heading up towards the Scottish Aviation Scamp designed in Prestwick uh, and the Enfield 8000, which some of you may know, motoring journalist Johnny Smith converted one recently into the world's fastest uh, legal street racer, uh, drag racer car. So they all were powered by lead acid batteries. But as I said, there was a long period of time between them. So why were they all lead acid? Well, looking at the earlier examples, uh, they were the only rechargeable chemistry available at first. The electric car had been around since the early to mid 19th century, but it had always been using single use disposable batteries. Then lead lead acid came along and gave you the opportunity to recharge them. The energy density, the amount of energy that you can squeeze into a particular mass or volume uh, was and still is very low in lead acid cells, about a tenth of a Tesla pack these days. But then again, back then, roads were very poor condition, top speeds were very slow as a result, you didn't need particularly powerful motors. So lead acid cars could actually do about 100 miles per charge a good 100 years ago. So these provided zero emissions motoring in an era when the only alternatives were unsafe petrol engines that you had to manually crank to get going, and a lot of people would break limbs in the process, and steam-powered cars that would take forever to go and weren't very good on hills. So as a result, uh, around about the turn of the 20th century, electric vehicles actually had a 33% global market share. But towards the mid-20th century, ironically, the electric motor killed the electric car by making internal combustion engines safer to start. Road conditions improved, the availability of petrol improved, and top speeds uh, continued to rise. And as a result, electric cars fell out of favour. There had to be a compromise uh, between speed and range, and typically that resulted in a range of about 40 miles at 40 miles an hour. However, during the oil crisis of the 70s, there was a renewed interest in electric vehicles due to the perceived imminent shortage of oil. But that said, during this era, alternatives were considered, uh, two prime examples being the nickel-iron battery jointly developed by Thomas Edison. This was a low-maintenance alternative to lead acid, and it was also a much longer-lived one. Jay Leno's example that's in that photo there is still using its original set 100 years on. Mind you, obviously, that does require some maintenance. 
they are highly tolerant of overcharging and over discharging so they don't mind a bit of abuse but they were expensive they added about a third of the cost onto the detroit electric optional nickel iron upgrade uh, rather than the standard lead acid they have a very high rate of self discharge so even when the car wasn't being used and even when they weren't plugged in they were still losing a lot of capacity and as a result their energy efficiency the amount of energy that you got out versus the energy you put in to charge it in the first place was low and as I said, because of their expense, they were surpassed by cheaper technologies. But Scottish Aviation were looking really ahead into the future. They were looking at the zinc air battery, which is a breathing battery. It therefore doesn't contain all of its reactants. And therefore, if something horrible did happen to it, it would have to source the oxygen that uh, completes the reaction with it from the air. And as a result, it was very difficult to get these things to blow up. They weren't very aggressive if, and if they were damaged. They were very lightweight. They were very energy dense. but over half a century later, the only metal air battery of any description that has been commercialized so far is a single use zinc air battery that's used in hearing aids. Moving on, the early 90s saw a glut of new chemistries coming into the automotive scene. First of which was molten salt that was used in the BMW E1 in 1991 and the Ford EcoStar in 1992. These had much higher energy density than lead acid, a good four times increase over them, which gave a much greater range of up to 125 miles per charge, even at a road to motorway speeds. There were sealed units as well, so there was no maintenance required, but they had a safety issue. The corrosive nature of molten sodium meant that the membrane that you can see in the middle could be breached and if it hit the molten sulfur in the other chamber then you could have a very aggressive flammable reaction and Ford EcoStar actually suffered a couple of battery fires during charging which put a halt to the entire program. The other issue is that the operating temperatures are ridiculously high. It's called molten salt for a reason. So 300 to 350 degrees C operating temperature meant that if the vehicle wasn't being used it had to be kept plugged in and if it wasn't kept plugged in it would take forever to reheat the battery once the uh, components had crystallized. Safety issues were improved with the invention of the Zebra cell, which had a different chemistry and was used quite recently in the Modec vans of the early 2000s. Unfortunately, they just preceded the latest wave of EV uptake and therefore the company went bust before they could realize their potential. Okay, so oh, a bit there about BMW and Ford. Mm -hmm. So, why did they decide to get into the EV market in the first place? Well, rather than having the bona fide best option for electric vehicles, which was the case in the early 20th century, and rather than having an oil crisis in the case of the 70s, these companies were now reacting to legislation. In the mid 80s, a lot of work research was done on climate change and a lot of governments started to take it seriously. And some of the more progressive ones were starting to introduce legislation saying that vehicle emissions needed to be curbed. One of the easiest ways to do that is to remove the emissions from the tailpipe altogether. So Ford and BMW and a number of other manufacturers were reacting to that legislation. Moving on. Uh, the 1995 uh, year saw the introduction of a number of nickel cadmium powered vehicles, not least my own in the photograph there, the Peugeot 106 electric. So these didn't have quite the same energy density as molten salt cells. It was about double the energy density of lead acid. Um, they also had a good power density. In other words, they can chuck their power out quite quickly. There's not a constraint in that regard. But NICAD has a number of flaws. So the energy density, as I said, is still low, which meant there was a compromised vehicle performance. The 106 in its original trim could only do 50 miles at a top speed of 60 miles an hour. Uh, cadmium was discovered to be highly toxic, and now NICAD is banned in the EU, quite rightly so, because of the content of cadmium. The chemistry is also what's called a flooded cell, which means that the deionized water, which formed part of that liquid electrolyte, had to be regularly topped up by a mechanic or by a skilled user. And also, the biggest flaw of NICAD is the memory effect. So if you don't routinely completely discharge a NICAD cell, say you go from 100% to 50% routinely and charge and discharge between the two, then at 50%, that voltage is going to drop and the battery is going to think, and anything that's attached to it and reading the voltage is going to think that the battery is flat, even though there's still residual energy left in it. So NICAD vehicles required a bit more of a maintenance procedure and a bit more of a running routine to keep them in good condition. This was improved by nickel metal hydride, which probably doubled the energy density again, uh, giving realistic 100 mile ranges for the likes of the GM EV1. That'll be familiar to anyone who's watched Who Killed the Electric Car. And the Toyota RAV4 EV 
1997, of which, by the way, uh, the surviving examples in the United States, many of them are still running on their original packs. Ni uh, nickel metal hydride is a long-lived chemistry and has a very high power density as well. Now, the advantage of a very high power density is that you can make a battery pack quite small, like, for example, the ones found in the Toyota Prius, um, but you can have a very high power output without damaging the cells. So a lot of non-plug-in hybrids still use nickel metal hydride cells today. They're also very tolerant of overcharge and they don't have a memory effect, but they were very expensive to begin with, up to $600 per kilowatt hour capacity. They also have a very high rate of self-discharge. Now, to put this into perspective, uh, I have a Mark I Honda Insight from 1999. That uses a nickel metal hydride battery pack, and if I leave that on the driveway for a couple of weeks, there is a noticeable drop in capacity of that pack, um, or state of charge, I should say. So that needs to be given a top-up charge. Uh, there was also the controversy surrounding Chevron buying the patents to nickel metal hydride cells and effectively banning the production of larger format cells, therefore delaying the uptake of electric vehicles by a decade. We could and should have been driving lots of Toyota RAV4 EVs throughout the early 2000s. But now, of course, we're into the modern era, lithium ion. Now, this has a number of advantages, not least the highest energy density of any commercially available cell chemistry at the moment. They're completely sealed cells. They don't require any maintenance. And because of the high energy and power densities, you can get amazing performance. Just look at the Tesla. Uh, you get pretty high ranges as well. I mean, originally, the Nissan Leaf could do about 80 miles per charge. The new one that's out now can do about 150, and that's only in, well, seven years or so's progress. So lithium ion has yet to even reach its full potential, but it's giving us really cross-country ranges and the ability to rapid charge them in half an hour. The only problem is that these cells are particularly sensitive to over-discharge and overcharge and to high temperatures and high currents. So as a result, they need to be looked after using more complex electronics called the battery management system. Uh, also, because the components are flammable, uh, you can sometimes end up with cell fires, as we've seen before. Um, one of the reasons for this is thermal runaway, and that's if the cell is abused to the point that the heat that it generates as part of the reaction becomes self-sustaining, even if you disconnect the thing from a charger, or even if you stop applying any load to it, if you disconnect it from whatever it's connected to, it'll just continue to heat itself until it vents gases or catches fire. And also, the anode, the negative electrode, deliberately has to be quite a bulky structure to improve safety. You can't use pure lithium foil for reasons I'll explain later. All right, so we have arrived at our first poll of the evening. So the question is, how many miles do you actually need on a single charge? So essentially, what, what mileage would you feel comfortable that an EV should have that would get you to and from your destination. Could be work, could be could be shopping. We know that uh, the average journey in Scotland is something like 10 kilometers and Scotland is well suited to electric vehicles. So just uh, have a little vote there and we'll give a few more seconds. Okay, seems that the majority of people have voted and 100 to 200 miles seems to be the, the preferred option with only 20% uh, of people needing a bit above that. So we're comfortably there already. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, actually, even the shortest range electric vehicles on the market today, uh, the sort of later models, um, will comfortably do well over 100 miles per charge. We're starting to see even some of the cheapest electric vehicles like the Renault Zoe uh, doing about 180 miles per charge. And within the next 12 months, there'll be a number of EVs released that can do between 200 and 250 miles per charge on a typical family budget. Obviously, Tesla is already in the 300 plus mile category. So let's do a bit of myth busting. The first one which comes up quite a lot is about the materials that are used in lithium ion batteries. And that's an entirely valid point. But in order to understand how this negative misconceptions come around, let's have a look at what's inside a lithium ion cell. So here we have the inside of our lithium ion battery. Let's make a shopping list, shall we? So we begin at the negative electrode. We need copper for the current collector. Now the current collector is 
a piece of metal that doesn't actually take part in the reaction but collects electrons that have taken part in that reaction. So you apply the active material, in this case the graphite, uh, to the current collector as a paste, which then solidifies, and then you put that inside the cell. So you need copper for that. Then the graphite for the negative electrode, as I've just said. Then, of course, you'll need lithium, although you may be surprised how little you actually need. Some sort of polymer material for the separator. An electrolyte, as I mentioned before, it's typically an organic liquid or gel of some description. You'll need a lithium salt. Looks a bit like table salt, wouldn't want to eat it. But uh, that will go in there to make the electrolyte conductive. Then for the positive current collector, you use aluminium. And then obviously for the material on the positive electrode that actually takes part in the reaction, you need a lithium metal oxide. Now, the vast majority of these you will see have highlighted use cobalt, apart from the one at the bottom, lithium iron phosphate, LFP, uh, which is particularly popular with electric buses and also with ridiculously high power applications because its power density is vastly superior to any other lithium ion chemistries. But as I say, Lithium and cobalt are the two that make all the headlines. So let's have a look at these in more detail. Starting off with lithium. So are we going to run out? No, not really. I mean, is it recovered from recycled battery materials today? Originally, surprisingly not. The surprisingly little lithium in a lithium ion battery, only about 7% by weight. And the materials that recyclers are most interested in recovering, and the only reason that lithium ion batteries were originally recycled was the copper and the cobalt, because that's worth more money. But we're now starting to see recyclers beginning to focus quite heavily on recovering lithium as well. For example, there's a South Korean recycler that's recovering lithium phosphate in its recycling process. So yes, we are recovering lithium from recycled batteries today now. And other recyclers are starting to set up, take note, and it's being done en masse. Are we going to run out? Absolutely not. There are tens and tens of megatons of lithium that are produced every year. There are vast lithium salt flats, uh, basically dried up historic seabeds in countries like Bolivia. Lithium can also be extracted from seawater itself, so you can just pipe it onto a very hot, arid piece of land and let it evaporate, and you can pan the salt that way. That's one example of how it can be, uh, how it can be obtained. You can also find lithium in surprising places, like the rich lithium brines in Cornwall, uh, which could actually ensure continuity of supply for the UK's burgeoning battery industry. And as with any mineral, the production is being ramped up with demand. So even though we keep hearing about perceived shortages, within a couple of years, that will be resolved. Are we going to be priced out by increasing demand? No. If lithium prices quadrupled overnight, the cost of battery packs in electric vehicles would increase by only 1.6%, and that cost would likely be absorbed by the manufacturer. And in fact, if those lithium prices did quadruple, then using earlier primitive recycling techniques for batteries, not the new, more advanced ones that we're seeing now that are cheaper and more cost effective, then lithium from recycled batteries using those old fashioned techniques would become economically competitive. So again, there is still incentive to recycle lithium and it continues to be recycled in increasing quantities today. Cobalt, now that is actually a picture of a Canadian town called Cobalt. Can you guess what they mine there? So is it recovered from batteries today? As I've just said, yes, it's because of the originally high value of cobalt that that was one of the main reasons to recycle lithium ion batteries in the first place. And it's estimated that some 25,000 tonnes of cobalt will be recycled annually from dead batteries by 2025. Are we going to run out? No. Uh, currently, just over half of cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which, as we know, with the child labour situations and political situations, does have its issues. But many manufacturers are seeking supplies from other nations, and others are trying to improve the supply chain in DRC. Mining companies are ramping up supply from other countries, not least Canada, which has its historic reserves. And are we going to be priced out by increasing demand? No. Again, cobalt, one of the more expensive materials in lithium ion batteries, but if prices were quadrupled, then the cost of battery packs would only increase by 10%. And we're starting to see new chemistries come in, which are considerably reducing the amount of cobalt in batteries, which I'll show you in just a minute. Okay, so you mentioned a couple of countries there, uh, Congo and Bolivia. But we know that they're not the countries that are actually manufacturing the batteries. So which countries are those, are they? Well, currently, battery manufacturing is primarily focused in four key areas. So you've got China, which currently produces about 60% of 
batteries and of lithium ion batteries in the world. Then there's the US, which thanks to the Tesla Gigafactory is going to have about 20% of battery production by 2020. Uh, South Korea has between 10 and 15% of production, but also has probably more, more of the most well-known brands, but they're just producing their batteries elsewhere. And then there's also Japan as well. But Europe is starting to get in on the stage as well. So LG Chem has just set up a factory, a big factory actually in Poland. I'm aware that there are other predominantly South Korean manufacturers that are looking to Central Europe increasingly to build their own gigafactories there because it's very close to where the huge consumer demand for electric vehicles is. Um, and on top of that, there's homegrown industries like Northvolt in Sweden which are start setting up their own gigafactories. Um, in fact, there's an increasingly concerted effort from the EU and from European manufacturers, particularly in the automotive sector, to try and build their own batteries from scratch and to build up a powerful manufacturing base in Europe too. But in the meantime, generally China, South Korea and the US have the majority. Now, I mentioned about reducing the amount of cobalt that's used in lithium ion cells. If you look at the very top there, you can see that lithium cobalt oxide has about 40% cobalt in it. Now that is something that's used historically in, in smartphones and continues to be used in, in smartphones today. The NMC111, so that's lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. So you've got one nickel for every manganese and for every cobalt. That was used in the BMW i3 to begin with. But now we're starting to see new chemistries coming out that have less cobalt. So for example, NMC622, where you've got six nickels for every two manganese for every two cobalt, you've halved the amount of cobalt that's used in that battery tech. And that's in some of the latest EVs on the market. And very soon we're going to see NMC811, which again halves the content. So you've only got 4% of that battery that's made up of cobalt. That's a tenth of what it was only a few years ago. And as I mentioned about LFP, which has no cobalt in it whatsoever, and is also a surprisingly safe chemistry, that's used quite heavily in the likes of electric buses and high performance uh, racing, drag racing applications and so on. Now, as I've said, there's a lot more cobalt in smartphone batteries than in EVs, and that means that recycling smartphone batteries will actually help to supply cobalt demand for EVs. So when your smartphone reaches the end of its life, don't bin it, make sure it's recycled responsibly, and that will help someone's Hyundai Kona or Nissan Leaf or any other EV out there to get the cobalt, very small amount of cobalt content that it will need for the next few years. Something else I want to show you just very quickly, look how little lithium is actually in a lithium ion battery, even the older designs, very little lithium. Okay, so a lot of positivity there about the materials in a battery. So why then are we seeing a delay in the procurement of EVs? Now that is primarily driven by a, basically just a lack of, of, of appreciation of just how popular EVs were going to become. If you look, for example, at Hyundai, when they uh, signed the contract with LG Chem to produce the batteries for the Ionic, the electric version of the Ionic, uh, they vastly underestimated demand. And as a result, there's a global shortage of Hyundai Ionic electric vehicles that people are queuing around the block for because LG Chem didn't get an, a big enough order for the battery. So they didn't ramp up their supply. But Gigafactories are being built around the world. Gigantic battery factories are being produced around the world. And we're starting to see the production of the raw materials ramping up as well. Uh, within the next two to three years, that issue will be overcome. However, within those next two to three years, demand for EVs is going to increase exponentially as well. So supply and demand, they're going to keep chasing each other um, for the foreseeable. But we are going to see the situation improving dramatically. So the next myth to bust is that batteries are expensive. Now that used to be the case, but allow me to demonstrate how quickly those prices are coming down. So here's my beloved 106 Electromobile on its way to Dundee Museum of Transport, where it's still on display, by the way, uh, as my new car, which is my Nissan Leaf, looks on. So the Peugeot 106 Electric, I had that upgraded to lithium iron phosphate in 2012. And at the time I went for an 18 kilowatt hour battery pack. Now that cost me just shy of six grand, which as a student hurt a lot. So that was just about 330 pounds per kilowatt hour. Compare that to the Nissan Leaf from only two years later. And that had a pack capacity that was a third bigger, but was a grand cheaper. So that works out at 205 pounds per kilowatt hour. And that's only in the space of a couple of years. We've seen that, that fall in, in cost just through uh, supply, you know, scales of, of, of demand really, or, or um, economy of scale, I should say. 
Now, that has continued to tumble. If you look, for example, at the Chevrolet Bolt, uh, which has been released just about everywhere in the world apart from the UK, thanks Chevrolet, um, that is a genuine 230, 240 mile range electric vehicle uh, with a battery pack that comes in at about 200 pounds per kilowatt hour. Just at the tail end of 2017, we saw the likes of the Renault Zoe and the new Nissan Leaf uh, giving battery packs with 150 pounds per kilowatt hour. And that price is continuing to tumble. Now, it's worth pointing out that the industry target for the cost of batteries is £100 per kilowatt hour. It's actually $100 per kilowatt hour, but you've seen what the pound's doing. And uh, we, that's been achieved using standard lithium ion chemistries, very boring lithium ion chemistries that have, are just you know, slight iterations on what's already been before. Just imagine what's going to happen when we start seeing new disruptive chemistries coming onto the market that are going to be made with even more sustainable cheap, uh, and cheaper materials. And I'll run through some of those towards the end of this presentation. And the other misconception is that the batteries are only going to last five years. That is categorically not true. EV batteries have been shown to be far more robust than even their harshest critics would have thought. A prime example of this is the mechanical EV ambassador that is WISI, the Nissan Leaf Taxi from Cornwall. It had clocked up 100,000 miles uh, halfway through its service life, and it had still got all of its state of health bars on the dashboard. Now, state of health refers to the full capacity of the battery now versus the full capacity of it when it was new. So obviously, as it degrades, it loses capacity, but it's still got all 12 bars there, which means it's in excellent condition. And it ultimately clocked up 174,000 miles in the space of four years before being retired as a taxi. I believe it's still in general use with a private customer who bought it off them. And incidentally, on a side note, as a testament to how reliable EVs are, the total repairs required during that entire service life, one ball bearing. Now, another consideration that people are worried about is the upcoming vehicle to grid. How's that going to affect your battery? Well, for some of you who don't know, uh, vehicle to grid is the ability to power your house using your electric car. So say you've come home from work, and uh, you've still got half the battery left. You can plug your car in, that powers the house, and then the house can recharge your car from the grid overnight. So why do it? Well, as you can see from the graph on the right-hand side there, there's a distinctive peak in demand in the UK national grid in the evening, and that obviously produces a lot of strain on the grid. Thermal power stations need to ramp up in order to cope with that. So if you can chop that peak demand, you reduce strain on the grid. And as we start to see the introduction of smart or dynamic tariffs, for example, Agile Octopus from Octopus Energy, we'll start to see people being able to safeguard against peak time prices because these agile uh, and you know, these agile dynamic tariffs are going to follow the wholesale market of electricity prices. And that means that at peak times, electricity will be more expensive. So if you can just use cheap electricity that you'd charged your car up with overnight, gone away, done your commute, gone to work and back, still have half the battery left, you can power your house off of off-peak electricity. So basically, as long as your car is plugged in, you get cheaper bills. It's economy seven, 24 seven, and you maximize the use of renewable energy as well. So if you have your car plugged in during the day and you're charging it off of solar panels on the roof, then you can use that sunshine in the evening once the sun's gone away to power your house. Now, is that going to degrade your battery because it's been given more of a workout? Actually, no. Uh, some of my former colleagues from WMG recently did a very thorough study on this and they've shown that actually the electric vehicle battery lifespan is improved by using vehicle to grid so clearly electric vehicle batteries enjoy a bit of a workout now we'll move on to our second poll of the day Yep. So do you think electric vehicles are portrayed positively or negatively in the media? So you use uh, Twitter, don't you, Ewan? I certainly do, yeah. I'm at 106 Ewan on the Twitters. Yep. And I, I know that you had some comments about a recent article relating to electric vehicles in the, the Scotsman. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, really, there, was, there were actually a number of different articles that have been published saying that the Energy Saving Trust uh, electric vehicle loan scheme had had next to no interest. This is 
categorically not true. When you look at the figures, they were actually oversubscribed for the financial year of 2017 to 2018. The number of applications that have the, the loan has received were grossly underreported in these articles. Uh, so yeah, naturally I uh, managed to get that corrected and many thanks to the Scotsman um, for uh, indeed correcting their, their article and uh, publishing the, the true figures because really interest in EVs is snowballing, particularly within the last 18 months we've seen interest go through the roof and if you look at the likes of the recent fully charged live event with Robert Llewellyn at Silverstone, 6,000 attendees, the vast majority didn't own electric vehicles but I bet you after that, give them 12 months, the vast majority will. Yeah. So. It looks like the majority of people have voted. Um, quite, quite an even balance there between yes and no. Myself, I would say electric vehicles are portrayed quite negatively in the media, or not as positively as they could be. Uh, but it seems to be quite an even one there. All right, let's uh, move on to our next slide then. Thank you. So. Why do EV batteries last longer than phone or laptop batteries? Because most people are used to the idea of a battery pack in their phone or their laptop dying within two to three years. Well, first of all, you've got better battery management. The superior battery management systems, that's the control electronics that look after the cells in the battery pack. And you've also got active thermal management. So that's typically air or liquid cooling or heating in many electric vehicles, which is a luxury that small consumer electronics cannot afford. It's a different operating environment as well. So electric vehicles in the UK typically operate between minus 10 and 30 degrees C. So that suits batteries quite well. Their optimum temperature for a lithium ion battery is about 25 degrees C. But a phone typically lives in your pocket, so 37 degrees C. If it's running lots of apps, it will get quite hot. It'll go up to about 50 degrees C. And as a result, it's always warm and that causes the cell to degrade quicker. But the situation is arguably worse in laptops because the processor in a laptop can get up to about 90 degrees C. And that means that the pack, which is located very close to the processor, is exposed to very hot temperatures and a temperature gradient allowed me to demonstrate. So here's an old fashioned battery pack made up of the same types of cells that you get in a Tesla Model S. So as the arrow indicates, there is a row that is closer to the inner most guts of the laptop and therefore closer to the processor than a row that's closer to the outside. And as a result, the row that's closer to the processor gets hotter and those cells degrade quicker. And quite often, if you were to open up a battery pack like this and check the capacity of each of the cells, the row that is outermost is actually still in very good condition. So just quickly there, on the minus 10 to 30 there, we know that uh, in some climates it actually goes above 30, maybe not mm. here, but uh, what would happen to the batteries in those uh, conditions or even below minus 10? Yeah, so if we look at the cold temperatures first, actually I'll be explaining a, a little bit about this uh, later on, but I'll give you a brief uh, sample of it just now. So as you may expect, as things get colder, things start to seize up a bit so that the kinetics of the, the lithium ion battery, the ability of the lithium ions to traverse from one electrode to the other, that slows down, which means that the internal resistance gets higher and it basically becomes harder to do the same job and as a result, you get less capacity. But more worrying, if you are rapid charging in very cold temperatures, it means that the well, basically, you get individual uh, potentials of each electrode. So a voltage is a potential difference between the two electrodes. And if anyone's done chemistry, they'll know what a standard potential is, which is the um, basically the, the potential of something measured against a standard reference, which is normally hydrogen. Um, and in this case, if we look at the anode versus lithium, then once the anode's potential reaches zero volts versus lithium, which it will do during charging because the anode voltage gets lower, or the anode potential gets lower whilst the cathode voltage gets higher during charging. And if it reaches zero volts, then that means that there's no longer any incentive for those lithium ions to pigeonhole themselves in between the layers of, of graphene. They just plate on the top of it. And that can cause 
the cell to physically swell because it's adding an extra layer into it that can cause the electrode structures to crack and it can also form branch-like growths called dendrites these can puncture the separator and internally short the battery so that's why when your electric vehicle is quite cold and it's rapid charging the rapid charger doesn't charge it as quickly as it would on a nice hot summer's day it's aware of this and the car's aware of this and they throttle back to preserve the battery whereas if you go too hot well the kinetics improve which means that you get higher performance that's why the tesla model s in ludicrous mode preheats the batteries to 50 degrees c so that it can get maximum performance but it automatically puts the coolers on as well because if it gets too hot then the electro the electrolyte can start to decompose uh, there's a, a layer of decomposition on the anode the solid electrolyte interface which is formed by a bit of lithium and a bit of the, the electrolyte decomposing over the first few cycles and ironically that decomposition prevents further decomposition under healthy conditions so you want that to happen initially but you don't want it to keep happening and that if you get too hot then that will keep happening and also if you get even hotter then that SEI starts to degrade as part of its you know, because of its temperature sensitivity and that can result in thermal runaway so you want to keep things in good condition now to be fair for most yeah for, for any environment on earth basically on land uh, you don't need to worry about the ambient temperature being too hot but you do need to worry about pushing the cells too hard and that's why you need thermal management to look after them properly so moving on uh, if we have a look at the battery management system now this is an area that I've recently gone into with Ducosi so the battery management system is a clever box of tricks that monitors the voltage of all cells in the pack and it monitors the temperature of the battery pack as well uh, and by taking these uh, figures it's able to adjust the peak power delivery and it's able to turn on and off any cooling systems any thermal management systems to keep the batteries in their their happy uh, operating temperature window and um, as I said previously about reducing the, the rapid charge that you get off a rapid charger in very cold temperatures, that's partly done by the BMS going, hang on a minute, we better throttle this back. Um, the additional concern uh, is giving state of charge buffers. Now state of charge is about the amount of energy that's in the cell now versus what it would be if it was fully charged. So it's expressed as a percentage of its full capacity. And lithium ion batteries do not like to be held at 100% state of charge all the time that's part of the reason why laptops that are continuously plugged in find that the battery degrades very quickly actually uh, whereas electric vehicles um, you know the only way that you'd be able to keep them plugged in at 100 percent even when you're using them is if you had a ridiculously long extension lead so that doesn't happen so it's a better environment for them but um, similarly they don't like to be over discharged because that irreversibly changes the structure of the electrodes and it can make it dangerous to to recharge um, but nonetheless, even the specified maximum and minimum voltage of the cells by the manufacturer, it's good to take a little bit of a buffer just so that the cell is definitely within a sort of safe operating zone and that ekes out the lifespan a bit. So when you fully charge your, say, your Nissan Leaf, it'll say it's 100% charged on the dashboard. Truth is, it's probably about 95% charged. There's a little buffer there that just makes sure that the battery continues to have as, as long a lifespan as possible uh, but we're starting to find that batteries have become even more robust than we first thought so the original leaf like mine short range Nissan leaf has a long life mode which if you enable that that stops the charging at 80 percent now the th theory was that that means that you would extend the lifespan of the battery that was removed when they gave it a battery upgrade to a bigger pack because they deemed it no longer necessary now Let's have a look in more detail about some of the parameters that the battery management system looks after. So the voltage of most lithium ion cells, the optimum of middle nominal voltage is about 3.7 volts. 3.2 for lithium iron phosphate is a different chemistry. It's got very different properties, so it's a bit lower. So if it goes above the maximum voltage, you'll find that the positive electrode becomes unstable. You get a, better, a much greater chance of thermal runaway. And if it goes too low, as I said, you irreversibly discharge it. Copper can start to leach out from the current collector. And if that uh, is allowed to recharge, then it starts to form dendrites that I mentioned, those branch-like growths. But whereas lithium is a very soft metal, copper is a lot harder, so it's more dangerous because those are particularly spiky branches. Uh, current, not really too much uh, to say about but a low current. There's not really too much, uh, much of a, a low current you know, consideration with that, but a high current means that the cell can generate too much heat and that again means that if it overheats you can get thermal runaway and then temperature as well ideally about 25 degrees c if you go 
too high, then you find that the electrodes start to become unstable. Again, thermal runaways are risk. If you go too low, you get the lithium plating that I talked about before, and that means that you potentially lose capacity because lithium uh, that's plated on during discharge can be undercut by lithium underneath it, and that makes almost like lithium icebergs that break off and they no longer can take part in the reaction. And also, as I said, mechanical strain, because you're physically creating another layer within the cell that has to squeeze everything else out of the way. Um, and that, as I said, of course, the dendrite growth risk of a short circuit. So let's have a look at the battery management system in action. We've got our voltage on the left and we've got our current on the right. So blue for voltage and me being colorblind, I think that's orange for current. But uh, let's rapid charge a cell, shall we? So it's down at its minimum voltage, it's discharged completely and it's charging up. We're giving it a high constant current, but it's about to surpass its maximum voltage. Now remember that power is current times voltage, so you want to be able to throttle that back. Uh, so what it will do at this point is it will throttle back the current whilst maintaining that maximum voltage, but not going over it. So this is called constant current, constant voltage charging, CCCV. Now this is quite important because a battery pack is made up of cells in series, so connected negative to positive to negative to positive, and that's like a staircase that increases the voltage of the pack. It's also made up sometimes of cells in parallel, so it's positive to positive, negative to negative, and that increases the width of the staircase, it increases the capacity in that sense. But the pack is only as strong as its weakest cell, and some cells in the pack will have slightly less capacity than others, and therefore because they are quicker to fill up, they'll reach their maximum voltage quicker, whilst the rest of them have yet to reach their maximum voltage. So CCCV is one way of helping to balance the pack by letting all those cells reach their maximum voltage without overcharging ones that have already reached the maximum voltage. And incidentally, it's good practice to let your electric vehicle fully charge and balance itself every so often just to keep the pack healthy and to keep the battery management systems, electronics, aware of the true capacity of the pack. Uh, so, for example, a Nissan Leaf will dedicate a good 40 minutes after it says it's 100% full to continuing the charge. That's it, just balancing the pack. So it's good to let it do that every so often. So battery management systems today, how do they work? How do, how do they look? Well, you can see that there are a myriad of cables in that battery pack there, and that is very typical of a modern battery management system. They do a good job, but there's room for improvement. So there's a very extensive wiring network, and that does not scale well. You just end up with a rat's nest of cables in there, and each of those cables provides a potential point of failure. It's added difficulty in servicing, having to disconnect cables and make sure you put them back in the right place, move things out of the way. There's extra components to recycle, and also there's no way of storing the cell history with the cell. So once you disconnect a cell from battery pack and leave it kicking about the workshop, if someone else comes along and there's no documentation with it, you have to do a series of tests to see what condition it's in. And there's also, because of the number of wires and because of the confined space of a battery pack, there are limitations in the number of voltage and temperature readings that can be provided. So prime example, the Nissan Leaf Pack again, 192 cells, but you only get 96 voltage measurements, and that's because the battery pack configuration is 96 stairs on the staircase in series, but the step is two batteries wide. It's, it's a two cell in parallel configuration. And you only get one voltage measurement per parallel string. It's very difficult to try and get individual voltage measurements for cells that are connected in parallel. And on top of that, due to space constraints, you've only got four temperature probes in there as well. But this is where my work comes in. Uh, the battery management system continues to evolve to improve the performance and lifespan of electric vehicles and grid storage. And Decozy's come up with a rather nifty solution uh, in Edinburgh. So we have no sensor wires, it's wireless. You have chips that are embedded into the cells at the point of manufacture. All you have is a wireless antenna loop that loops back to one very small box of tricks that's able to process everything in conjunction with the chips that's inside the cell. So it's a lot less bulky, it's a lot easier to package and to service, and it scales very neatly. So you saw what the situation was before, that's what it would look like afterwards. You would just have one big antenna loop. And also because the electronics are embedded in every cell, that means you can get the voltage, the temperature, the state of charge, how full it is, the state of health, uh, how much capacity it has versus new, for every single cell in the pack. And that means that if you are servicing a pack, if you're removing cells and then leaving them somewhere in the workshop, you just need to come along with a magic wireless wand and that will, if you tap it on the cell, tell you everything you need to know, which makes it a lot easier when you're repurposing, for example, an old electric vehicle battery pack into grid storage applications or similar. It makes it a lot easier to recycle them at the end of use because you know what condition of cell you're dealing with. 
And also, I mentioned previously the SEI layer growth, that's typically done as part of the production process. It'll be put onto a standard uh, charge and discharge procedure to form that initial healthy decomposition layer. But every cell is unique, so the ability to tailor its own formation process and say, a bit more charge here, a bit more discharge there, to give the perfect layer is very advantageous, because that'll improve the lifespan of every single cell in the pack right from the offset. But for manufacturers who have already ordered in thousands of cells without these chips, we also offer it as a bolt-on board as well. So that's something that could be done as a retrofit. Now let's turn to the future and look at what could be powering your electric vehicle in 10 years' time. So first of all, the one that I worked on, Lithium Air. This, as I said, is a breathing battery. Uh, which sources oxygen from the air. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to draw any diagrams for these ones, so you'll just need to paint a picture in your mind. But if you take the negative electrode of a lithium ion cell, which is carbon, and shift it over to the positive electrode, get rid of the heavy metal oxide, so you've just got carbon on one side, and then you've got lithium foil, which this time is safe to use as a negative electrode on the other side. So you've got far cheaper materials in there. You've removed the heavy metals, and you've made it so much lighter. You made it so much more energy dense because it's absorbing oxygen through the porous carbon. There's an exposed uh, section that's exposed to the air. And that lets oxygen in to react with lithium to form lithium peroxide. Unfortunately, the power density of lithium air at the moment is very low. So it's suitable for some applications, but for electric vehicles, particularly high performance ones, it could be a bit of a struggle. And also, there are a number of reasons why this cell chemistry has yet to manage more than 100 cycles. Uh, too many to go through just now, but there are hurdles that need to be overcome. That said, there have been promising developments in the lab recently, not least when we've discovered that the very constituent components of air that we were trying to keep out of our test cells because we were worried that they would impact on, on the health of it and degrade it quicker, like for example water and carbon dioxide. Turns out a sprinkle of each actually improves the lifespan of these cells, which means they're a lot more rough and ready than we'd previously thought. Sodium ion next, which is similar to lithium ion in some ways, but sodium is a far more abundant material and it's far more sustainable as well. In fact, the Positive electrodes can also potentially be made from biologically derived materials. So you're talking about a much more eco-friendly technique and a 30% cost reduction. The other advantage is it can safely discharge all the way down to zero volts, which is perfect for storing and shipping. Because even if you shorted them during shipping or storage, they wouldn't be able to do anything because they were already fully discharged and you could recharge them quite happily. They can also be produced on lithium ion production lines, but not necessarily using the same materials as lithium ion, because a standard lithium ion negative electrode, those layers of graphene, those are just about wide enough for lithium ions to intercalate into, to pigeonhole into. But sodium is a bigger atom, and as a result, it smashes the graphene sheets to smithereens. So you need a different, uh, a different format. You need a hard carbon instead of graphite. So you've got a, a much more sort of porous structure rather than a layered structure. But nonetheless, that, that is you know, something that could still be produced on a lithium ion production line, even if the energy density is less. It would still be a particularly useful chemistry, for example, for long distance haulage and for budget vehicles and energy storage applications that are already automotive prototype uh, level of, of cells, of, of sodium ion cells being produced in Scotland. Uh, next up, lithium sulfur. Uh, again, far less toxic, more abundant materials, not least sulfur instead of heavy metal oxides. Um, the electrolyte is non-flammable, uh, so it's a lot safer when the cell is damaged. It's got a higher gravimetric energy density. In other words, the amount of energy you can squeeze in per kilogram, much higher than lithium ion. So that's, again, good for heavy vehicles or vehicles that need to be lightweight. So, for example, planes. And it's also got a good tolerance to temperature and pressure. So again, aerospace will benefit from that. However, the volumetric energy density, in other words, how much you can squeeze in to a particular litre, uh, per litre, per volume, is similar to lithium ion. So is there going to be much of a range increase for a typical electric car? Well, OK, it'll be lighter, but just how much of an increase will there be? Uh, there's also an issue of large expansion and contraction of the electrodes during cycling as well, which ultimately will crack the thing over time. And the so-called shuffle phenomenon, where when the lithium goes across to the sulfur and forms its final product, it actually then decides to, occasionally decides, to revert to an intermediate stage of the reaction and then fully discharge, then intermediate, then fully discharge, without us telling it to charge. This is still a discharge reaction. Now, that protects against overcharge in the case of charging, but it results in several problems, not least capacity loss and a high rate of self-discharge. That said, 
progress has been made by a company near Oxford called Oxis, um, which again has been producing automotive scale prototypes for a while and is now building a gigantic factory in Brazil to produce them. And finally, solid state lithium, the one that's been making all the headlines recently. This can safely use lithium foil because what you've done is you've removed the liquid electrolyte and the polymer separator and you've replaced it with a solid electrolyte that is impervious to lithium dendrites. So therefore, you can use that pure lithium foil. And that means that the, the battery is so much more energy dense than it is versus using bulky carbon. So you've got that inherent protection against dendrites. Some designs have a significant increase in the power that they can deliver as well. So we're looking at ultra fast charging of an electric vehicle in the space of maybe 10 minutes or less. Also, they can safely operate at a much higher temperature range than lithium ion batteries, and they can continue to deliver a high rate of power, even at extreme temperatures. They also have a very long cycle life in theory, but there is a trade-off between the amount of power they can deliver and the lifespan caused by the electrolyte itself. There are two different types. There's a ceramic material, which gives a very high power density, but it's very inflexible. It's, it's brittle and it can crack over time as the electrodes swell and contract during cycling, which obviously is a hazard. Similarly, polymer, well, the opposite, I should say, is flexible, but unfortunately, it's lithium ion conductivity is very low. So the power density, the amount of power it can deliver is very low. But there's been recent progress made in terms of putting additives in the polymer electrolyte that improve its conductivity of lithium ions and therefore improve the maximum power. This is the one that there are a number of big names that have launched their own research programs into, not least Toyota and Dyson. And they are fairly confident that they could potentially have electric vehicles running on solid state lithium cells by 2025. But my top tip, if you combine the cheap, abundant nature of sodium with the solid state nature of solid state lithium to produce solid state sodium ion batteries, you could end up with cheap non-toxic batteries and they're going to give a huge increase in range to EVs, even if the sodium solid state is not going to be quite as energy dense as lithium solid state, it's still going to be a huge increase in what we've got today. That's going to vastly reduce charging times, it's going to be so cheap and it's going to likely outlive the vehicle in which it's installed as well. well that's all I have to say for now. Uh, as I've said before, I'm 106 Yoon on Twitter. I'm always more than happy to answer any queries that you have. I hope you found that interesting. Now, over to Gordon. Okay, perfect. Uh, just lastly, a bit of a prediction time. Based on the future of batteries, how often do you think the average uh, driver will need to charge their battery and what kind of, how quickly can that be done? Um, using today's chemistries, using what electric vehicles are available today, it honestly depends on the journey. Uh, so, for example, I have what I call a short-range Nissan Leaf. It's got the smallest battery, 24 kilowatt hours. I drove 16 miles to get here today, uh, but I'd only used 13% of the battery. Now, a car that normally gives me about 80 mile range, that's on for 120 mile range, which is the same as the bigger battery, 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf. It entirely depends on your usage pattern. So for example, taxi drivers that are typically doing city center speeds, um, but long shifts, even a short range Nissan Leaf can cover that comfortably. And that's why we see, for example, um, Dundee with something like 92 electric taxis in it already and growing. I know that Tony Kenmuir in Edinburgh has, has obviously added electric taxis to his fleet as well. That's going to continue to grow. For long range motorway mileage, then obviously a shorter range Nissan Leaf would probably need to stop every 60, 70 miles. But that's if you're flooring it and if you've got the heating on and so on as well. It really comes down to how you drive it. In my perspective, I do about a 50 mile round trip, mostly motorway traffic and hilly A roads every day. Um, I plug it in when I get to work. Uh, I have a home charger as well, but I rarely bother. Um, but that said, I, I get away quite happily with one charge a day. But we're starting to see with the, the likes of the Hyundai Kona, uh, the Kia Niro, and the, the new Nissan Leaf that will be out at the end of this year, all of which are comfortably over 200 miles per charge. Most people would probably just need to top it up as often as they top up a petrol car. So rapid chargers, we're, we're talking currently, they, they say 80% in 30 minutes. Are we yeah. seeing that that's going to have a... Is that going to go down a lot or does that need to go down a lot? It is. Well, it's it's going to go down in a way, but it's, it's, it's all relative. So the new Leaf, for example, that's coming out uh, at the end of this year, will do 100 kilowatts rapid charging. The Leaf at the moment does 50 kilowatts. Mine does 50 kilowatts. Um, but that said, uh, even though it's got double the rapid charging power, it's also got 
well, over double the battery size. So it's still around about 80% in half an hour. Um, that said, with the onset of the 350 kilowatt super duper rapid chargers that we're starting to see being implemented across Europe, including in Scotland and, and the UK, um, we're going to start to see charging times genuinely coming down um, as an absolute to say 15, 20 minutes and maybe even less, especially once solid state cells come out because they're just so much more tolerant to rapid charging, not least because of a or potentially lower internal resistance. Okay, and that should be combined with capacity rising so less of a need to charge publicly anyway. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean if, if you want to, you could treat it you could treat your car, your EV like a petrol car, and you could do 300, 400 miles per charge in the very near future and then just top it up once a week on a rapid charger in a space of five, ten minutes in, in theory. But that said, why would you? If you've got access to off street parking um, or to a, a slower charge point on your street that gives you a preferential cheaper tariff than a rapid charger, then surely what you would do is you would just plug in and graze when you've got that opportunity, especially if you have your own home renewables like solar panels. You could potentially run your car for free. And in my case, I mean, I, I'm regularly doing cross-country trips in my uh, in my leaf. You know, I'm, I'm doing intercity trips from Edinburgh to Dundee and Glasgow. I rarely use a rapid charger because by the time I've spent a couple of hours uh, doing what I need to do, shopping or visiting relatives or friends or whatever, chances are the smaller onboard charger has grazed most of the capacity of the pack anyway. So you don't really need it. Rapid chargers are there very much as a backup for people doing longer journeys or who are in a rush and they absolutely do need to exist and it's worth having them but people who think that that's going to be their primary mode of recharging especially if they have access to home or workplace charging that's that's kind of missing out on part of the advantages of evs your home is your petrol station yeah mm -hmm. okay uh we should move on to our our final poll here if we can just very very quickly so Looking at uh, the drawbacks of EVs, uh, what do you think is the biggest drawback of electric vehicle batteries based on everything that you've just heard before? Uh, I should also say that we are aware that the, the last poll had a clause in it, so it was a it was a yes or no to positively or negatively. <laughs> we'll just blame the software on that. We'll say that it determined it to be a, a yes or no question. Uh, right, quickly. Um, quick as we can. It looks like battery range and supply issues are the biggest drawback, followed by surprisingly none of the above, mm. and then charging times. I wonder what uh, none of the above refers to. <laughs> yeah, I'd be interested to find out. But I mean, that said, the battery range. Obviously, I was mentioning my leaf, which, as far as um, owning an electric vehicle uh, and doing longer journeys goes, I'm doing that on boss mode because I've got the smallest battery pack of pretty much any EV, um, apart from perhaps the Mitsubishi iMev. But looking at the new Nissan Leaf, 150 mile range, and you can rapid charge that. The Renault Zoe, 180 mile range, and you can rapid charge that, and it's about the cheapest EV on the market. Um, Obviously, as I said, there's a range of electric crossovers from Hyundai and uh, and Kia coming out. They'll do comfortably over 200 miles without even trying the new Leaf at the end of the year. That range issue is quickly coming down. And to be honest, I can't do 200 miles without stopping. I once did 330 miles from Edinburgh to Coventry without stopping and then couldn't feel my legs. So it's good to stop. And the dwell time, the average dwell time uh, for a motorway service station is about 25 minutes, which is all the time you need to top up your electric car and move on to the your destination. And get a coffee. Uh, right, let's move on to the Q&A now. Uh, just looking at the questions, got a couple of happy birthdays, so thank you for that. Uh, this is not my forte, so if I ask you a dumb question, just please let me know. Oh, go on. Uh, right. Why is the positive terminal aluminium and not copper? That's a really good question. So aluminium is used because it's lighter uh, and therefore obviously you improve the energy density of the cell, but you can't use aluminium on the negative electrode because of, remember I mentioned the standard potentials before? Well, the aluminium would degrade at the potential, the standard potential of that reaction. So basically the reactions that are going on at the negative electrode happen 
at a lower voltage, if you wish, than the aluminium can cope with. So it would end up leaching into the system. So unfortunately, we have to use copper, which is more expensive and which is heavier, just to deal with that. Okay. All right. Uh, next question, same asker. Is there an environmental risk to mining lithium, uh, such as seen with fracking? Well, I think that fracking is just about as insane as you can get when it comes to mineral extraction uh, or, or resource extraction. Lithium, it depends on how you're obtaining it. So, uh, as I say, from the likes of the salt flats and so on, I would think that the environmental risk is quite minimum. Uh, the lithium brines in Cornwall, again, the environmental risk is very, very minimal because it's, I think, it's mainly down old abandoned mining shafts. Um, but inevitably, there'll be some. Uh, minerals uh, that contain lithium that would actually be removed from the ground, just like if you were extracting uh, copper or any other sort of metal ore. Um, so again, you know, you would want to obviously, uh, you know, bear in mind environmental considerations there and, and local wildlife and water tables and so on, just to be sure. But fundamentally, lithium seems to be one of the easier uh, minerals to get your hands on if you know how. And it seems to be one of the, the safer ones with, with less dodgy consequences than, as I say, there's, there's definitely far more toxic materials out there that we, we get our hands on every day. So um, it seems to be a lower risk. OK, uh, here's a good one. Uh, for the purposes of battery manufacture, is the quality of recycled materials as good as newly mined materials, such as lithium and cobalt? That's a really good question again. Now, this is where my personal experience runs out, but as a, a sort of educated sort of knowledge of, of what I do have, um, typically when you're recycling uh, lithium ion batteries, if you're looking at the, for example, the cobalt, that's typically obtained, if my memory serves me correctly, or at least one method you can obtain it by is electrolysis. So basically, you've got a highly charged uh, electrode and the cobalt from the sort of smelted lithium and then crunched up and um, shredded lithium ion batteries is attracted to that and grows as a you know a, a cobalt um, mass on this electrode so it should be reasonably easy to get a, a fairly pure uh, example of and then any further refinement processes that are applied to cobalt containing ores can take it from there um, I don't think when it comes to the quality of lithium or cobalt or copper from recycled lithium ion batteries that we've got too much of a quality concern. But that said, I would be interested during my uh, adventures and as we start to see more and more recycled material making it into production lines, initially experimentally and then commercially, I'd be interested to have a closer look at that quality. But I, I suspect that even today, the quality is pretty good and it's only going to get better because it's an area that is having millions of pounds of research thrown at it, not least the uh, the, the government's Faraday Challenge uh, project, uh, which injects millions into projects that are all about trying to improve every aspect of electric vehicle batteries. Okay, next question. Is there a ceiling imposed by the laws of physics or chemistry in terms of energy density of batteries made from current materials? So what is the realistic maximum range we're likely to see from these batteries? Yes, there is. So if you look, for example, at uh, graphite off the top of my head, so the, the negative electrode material in standard lithium ion, that's about 372 milliamp per hours per gram, I think is the, the ceiling on that. And then it tends to be the cathode, which is the, the, you know, the positive electrode that's a bit more limiting. So we are starting to kind of approach that that ceiling, I think, realistically, with, with lithium ion in its current form, a lot of improvements in energy density have come by reducing the thickness of the current collectors and of the separators as well. And we have seen situations where people have perhaps gone a bit too far, the Samsung Galaxy Note 7 being a prime example. Uh, the separator on that was wafer thin. And unfortunately, once that battery was in the phone, the corners of them were pinched which allowed that short circuiting to happen very quickly. So um, that's not happened in electric vehicles. There's a, a very, obviously very stringent tests that they have to go through and the entire industry is far more um, conscious of, of, of that particular issue now. But yeah, we are probably range wise, probably gonna plateau out about 400, 450 miles per charge at a ceiling with conventional lithium ion. However, these new disruptive chemistries that I've just gone through are gonna easily double, triple, quadruple that. So fear not. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's not necessarily something we require. No. Essentially not in this no. country. 
Absolutely not. I mean, as I said, with the Toyota RAV4 EV, uh, you know, the 100 mile range SUV from 1997, I guarantee you that if that had been pushed in a similar way as the Nissan Leaf using a cell chemistry that is not currently as energy dense as lithium ion, and I cannot foresee ever being anywhere near as energy dense as lithium ion's cutting edge uh, iterations today. That 100 mile range was still more than enough for most people. I mean, your average journey length in the UK is well under 30 miles. And, you know, a lot of places are putting in workplace charging. There's a disproportionate um, number of people who, who own vehicles who have access to off-street parking. Obviously, we need to figure out how we're going to do on-street charging and so on as well. But the, for the vast majority, that doesn't help you if you live in a flat, admittedly, but for the vast majority, it's, 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 it should be fine. 100 miles is, is more than manageable. Um, I mean, I've been doing that since 2009. So, um, in fact, I've been doing half that range since 2009. So, uh, yeah, realistically, I think that the current crop of EVs we've got now for between 150 and 250 mile range, that will do 99.9% .9 of journeys. We don't necessarily need that extra range, certainly in the UK. Okay, uh, we have absolutely tons and tons of questions here. Good to hear. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, get a, just a, an easy one. Okay, here's one. Will we see companies such as Nissan build gigafactories in the UK? Now, Nissan actually does have its own cell producing capability at Sunderland. Uh, although, interestingly, Nissan did make their own cells. Uh, themselves, Nissan branded cells, but they recently sold their cell manufacturing business. So unless I'm mistaken, now what's happening is a third party, I think it was possibly Chinese investment that had bought it of some description, can't remember the name of the company or companies, but um, basically the, the Nissan Leaf cells are going to be produced in Sunderland in Nissan's gigantic factory by another company. So that's going to make for interesting coffee breaks and stuff with people trying to, you know, um, shelter their ring binders full of confidential data and so on. But um, I think Volkswagen uh, and a number of German manufacturers are looking at building their own gigafactories and doing things in-house and having that same vertical integration approach that Tesla has done so successfully in terms of getting costs down. But interesting to see that one of the pioneers, Nissan, have just sold their battery business. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that should be it, people. We have tons more questions so I'll pass them all on to you and, and uh, we'll see if he is able to to send you an answer. Well certainly as I say you've got my contact details at the bottom of the screen there fire me a tweet I'll try and get back to you. All right so thanks everyone for tuning in thanks Ewan for the in-depth presentation I hope you all enjoyed it and based on everything that was discussed we will send your qualifications in the post. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right thanks guys bye-bye.